Is there anything more divine than the beautiful human body? And was it not the Hellenes who first discovered it? That was the secret truth which the whole of their ecstatic religion revealed to them. Divinity is in the flesh. We often speak of the philosophy and statecraft which we inherited from the Greeks, but this is all abstract. The things which we inherited from the Greeks that we can still see and touch are their statues, depicting beautiful, powerful, athletic bodies. And implicit in these statues, concealed within their immortalized flesh, are the two greatest things which we have received from the Greeks the idea of heroism and the idea of nature. The writings of Homer and Pindar show us how, for the Greeks, the beautiful body contained within it both the essence of heroism and of nature. In Twilight of the Idols, Nietzsche wrote, quote, In Athens, Cicero expresses his surprise that the men and youths were by far superior to the women in beauty. But what work and effort the male sex had demanded of itself for centuries there in the service of beauty. For one must not be mistaken about the method here. Merely training one's feelings and thoughts is worth practically nil. First, one must convince the body. It is decisive for the lot of a people and of humanity that one begin culture at the right place, not in the soul, as was the fatal superstition of the priests and semi-priests. The right place is the body, demeanor, diet, physiology, and the rest is a consequence. For this reason, the Greeks are still the first cultural event of history. They knew, they did, what was needed." End quote. The secret teaching of the Hellenes was opposite to the secret teaching of Christianity and its predecessors. For Homer's Greeks, the soul was something fleeting, and it was in the body or in its legacy that immortality could be found. In the Iliad, when the hero's body is torn apart by bronze and the earth drinks his lifeblood, all that is left is a shade which scuttles off to the underworld to wander, pale and listless, through the fields of Hades. Even Achilles' shade, as we discover in the Odyssey, sits in sorrow in the dark, bewailing his fate. When the lifeless corpse of a hero is consumed by birds or the flame of the funeral pyre, swallowed by the earth or the sea, all that is left is a pale whisper of what one once was, forever lost in a faraway land. But in that moment just before death, when one's body shines with divine splendor, when it exudes beauty and power, then the gods themselves are present in the flesh, then one is Dios, shining, godlike. In the Iliad, Achilles is most divine in the height of his superhuman rage on the battlefield. He is described as godlike, Dios, literally meaning shining. He is compared with the forces of nature to a blazing fire. His divine heritage is repeatedly evoked, and he is even described as equal to a god. In his berserker rage, Achilles slaughters every Trojan who comes before his blade, and even contends with the river god Scamander. Quote, Just as fierce fire rages through a dry mountainside, and the forest is consumed as the wind drives the flames and whirls them every which way, so raged godlike Achilles with his spear, pressing down upon the men he slew, and the earth ran black with blood. Just as white barley is tread beneath the feet of bellowing bulls, Achilles' horses trampled corpses and shields together, and the wheels of his chariot were splashed with blood. But Peleus' son pressed on to win himself glory, as his irresistible hands were splattered with gore." End quote. It is in the height of his glory, his splendor, his inhuman power, when he shines like a god and is as unstoppable as a force of nature, that Achilles achieves immortal glory through the superhuman power of his semi-divine body. In his moment of glory, Achilles shines so brightly that the light of his deeds and his name shine through the ages 
even reaching us thousands of years later. This heroic ethos, expressed in early Greek works like those of Homer and Pindar, is completely opposite Christian doctrine and much of late Greek philosophy, which posits the body as profane and the soul as divine. In the Bible, the soul, not the body, is the image of God and the source of immortality. As the Apostle Paul argues in 1 Corinthians, resurrection is not for the quote, natural body, but for the quote, spiritual body, and quote, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, end quote. When speaking of what happens to the body after resurrection, Paul writes, quote, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body, end quote. Paul elaborates that the body dies like a seed, but something new is born from it, the spiritual body, which is the metaphorical wheat. But for Homer's Greeks, that which blossomed from the dying body was immortal glory and everlasting fame. That was the only hope of immortality for the Greek hero. The feats of the body in pursuit of arete, distinction, and excellence was for the Greeks the highest virtue, and the everlasting glory, the undying name thereby acquired, was their immortality. This philosophy is contained within the poems of Pindar, a Theban lyric poet who wrote poems celebrating great athletes. In Selective Breeding and the Birth of Philosophy, Kostin Alamariu writes about Pindar's use of the idea of nature. Quote, Pindar's own explicit use of the word nature, phusis, and associated forms of the verb from which Fusis itself is derived seem at first sight to have multiple meanings, not directly related. The verb is usually translated in English as to grow, while the noun Fue is translated as growth and also as stature. These translations, however, are limited and somewhat misleading. Nature, Fusis, Fue, refers first of all and always and above all, to a concrete material reality, to a biological reality that means very plainly the body. End quote. Through etymological reconstruction, we can tell that the Proto Indo European verb for to be also meant to grow, and that this may have been its original and primary meaning. To be is to grow, and thus the idea of being itself has a botanical meaning. Alamariu continues, quote, Now, first of all, Greek does have another word for body, with which the reader may be better acquainted, namely soma, and Pindar does use the word soma five times by my count. In all but one case, the reference is exclusively to the dead body, to corpses, this is in keeping with the Homeric use of soma. When Pindar speaks of a body that is alive, he uses the word fue. Thus, already, in this distinction, there is an important clue as to the full meaning of fusis. In truth, this hint was already dormant in Homer's limited use. There is a botanical association in both Homeric usages of nature. The branch on which Achilles lays his great oath is said to be sprouting, and is contrasted to the dead wooden scepter in Agamemnon's hands, which stands for the authority granted from mere convention. In Pindar as well, we see this same bear or old meaning of Fusis in two of the 17 examples. In one case, where there is a reference to a statue, quote, carved from a single piece of wood, end quote. The unusual choice of word here may be inspired by the fact that the object in question is a religious idol, consecrated to a god housed in a rustic altar, and therefore vibrant with demonic energy. The other example where nature has an explicitly botanical meaning is introduced in a prophecy that the centaur Chiron gives to Apollo, wherein a queen and future bride of Apollo is said to be given the land of Libya. Quote, not unblessed by trees bearing all kinds of fruit." End quote. 
From Alamaru's analysis, we can see that fue is also associated with botanical life, fertility and reproduction, with becoming, growth, birth, and being. It thus strikes at the heart of the Greek mystery rites, which celebrated the miraculous rebirth of life out of death, which takes place in the plant world and is mirrored in the generational reproduction of men. The Homeric Hymn to Demeter outlines, though not explicitly, the meaning of the Greek mystery rites, in particular the Eleusinian mysteries. The Hymn to Demeter is a story about death, symbolized by Persephone being kidnapped by Hades and the resultant death of all plants on Earth. It is a story about reproduction, symbolized by Persephone's metaphorical loss of virginity when she eats of Hades' pomegranate seeds and is therefore permanently wed to him. And it is a story of rebirth, when Persephone at last emerges from the underworld, bringing a rebirth of plant life on Earth, and therefore a salvation of man, who depends on the nourishment gained from plants to live. In Eleusis, archetypal image of mother and daughter, Karl Karenyi discusses the Homeric hymn to Demeter. He writes, quote, the myth is related to the nourishment men derive from plants. The context can be characterized most suggestively with the help of Greek words. Zoe means not only the life of men and of all living creatures, but also what is eaten. In the Odyssey, the suitors wish to eat up the Zoe of Odysseus. The same meaning attaches to Bios, the characteristic life of men. Where men draw their nourishment chiefly from plants, the nutritive plants, not only grain but the tuberous and fruit-bearing plants as well, are individually perishable, destructible, edible, but taken together they are the eternal guarantee of human life." End quote. The English word essence, from the Latin esse, to be, is etymologically connected with the German essen, to eat, and all of these words can be traced back to some original Proto-Indo-European notion related to being, growth, biology, nourishment, the body, and reproduction, something which we have received through the Greeks as the idea of nature. Alamariu goes on to lay out how, in Pindar, Fue is connected with Arete, excellence and virtue. The man of Fue must obey his inner nature, his essence, which drives him towards deeds of glory. Alamariu writes, quote, This obedience is expressed as their being ever ready to abandon safety and mere life for the danger of death and the winning of a great renown. But the point would seem to be that Fua literally carries some compulsory or irresistible power that orients and repels them towards deeds of areta. End quote. He continues, quote, Real men, Andres, have being, or have more being. They have reverence for their being, or body, and listen to its vehement calling. They can't help but listen or obey in this case. These men are apparent and manifest in their great deeds. The watchful eye of the seer, the poet, picks these out and preserves the deeds in words to make them apparent, visible, through time, to make their fame or being endure." End quote. Those who are descended from the gods and therefore share in their essence Demigod heroes like Hercules and Achilles have more being, more reality than normal mortals. They are more real and more true because their essence, their will, their life force, their fue is stronger. And this fue, this divine inner essence, is contained within their body and blood and expressed through the ferocity and strength of their inner nature. Finally, we come to the complete picture. One's nature, one's biological being and essence is found in the body, and in a certain sense is synonymous with the body. Thus, Fue, 
this intensified nature found in heroes comes from kinship with the gods. It shines forth from the hero's body and drives them towards deeds of arete, excellence, which gain them immortal fame and even deification. The inner nature which drives all of life expresses itself in its highest, most pure form in the beautiful, youthful body filled with power and dynamic being. The beautiful, powerful body is the most pure form of being, of life. It is the most true and real thing. The awe at this pure being found in the poems of Pindar can also be found in the final lines of the Homeric hymn to Demeter, where Demeter says to her daughter, Persephone, quote, when the earth sprouts with every kind of fragrant flower in the spring, out of the misty darkness you will rise again, a great marvel for gods and mortal folks." End quote. Demeter is foretelling the seasonal rebirth of youthful and vibrant life out of death, which was the miracle at the center of the Eleusinian mysteries. This worship of the essence at the heart of life and the desire to intensify this essence was the centerpiece of the Hellenic worldview, and more generally the Indo-European worldview. It is found in the European Christ, who is a Dionysian and Eleusinian deity, and represents the rebirth of youth, of life, out of death, just as Persephone did. And it is found in Nietzsche's idea of the will to power, which might be equated with the Greek phoue, and the creation of the Ubermensch, who, like the Greek heroes, possesses an intensified will to power, an intensified essence and being. This heroic worldview was somewhat suppressed during the Middle Ages in Europe due to Christianity's mistrust of the body and bodily passions. But during the Renaissance, the appreciation of the beautiful human form, of the heroic body as the highest flower and fruit of life, emerged again. The heroic worldview had endured under medieval Europe's anti-corporeal veneer. But during the Reformation and Enlightenment, interest in physical culture went into hiding again, only to re-emerge in the 1800s with a revived interest in the classics, nature, and biology, driven by writers like Winckelmann, Darwin, and Nietzsche. In the 1800s, bodybuilding emerged again for the first time since classical times. In Germany, folkish, back-to-nature movements emerged, which idolized the naked human form and holistic health, and championed a return to nature and paganism. Though these movements began as something akin to pagan hippie movements, their aesthetics and language carried over into fascist Germany and Italy. And probably in part due to this, interest in physical culture again waned after World War II, but it was revived once again during the 60s and 70s with American bodybuilding, and has only grown since. Perhaps this ancient spirit, which has been struggling for centuries to re-emerge, is at last here to stay. Today, gyms are filled with young men, and though they may not know it, they are implicitly embracing the heroic worldview, and striving to allow their nature to shine out through their bodies as the highest and most intense expression of the essence of life and life's striving against entropy and death. In a synthetic, industrial age such as ours, when nature is far removed from most humans' lives, their inner nature draws them towards the image of the beautiful and powerful body, which is the most visceral and vivid expression of the heroic ideal. In Sun and Steel, Japanese writer Yukio Mishima wrote about how the discipline of steel restored vitality to his body and soul. As a young man, Mishima was sickly, frail, and overly intellectual, but the discipline of bodybuilding restored life to his body and spirit. He writes, quote, The groups of muscles that have become virtually unnecessary in modern life, though still a vital element of a man's body, are obviously pointless from a practical point of view, and bulging muscles are as unnecessary as a classical education is to the majority of practical men. 
muscles have gradually become something akin to classical Greek. To revive the dead language, the discipline of the steel was required. To change the silence of death into the eloquence of life, the aid of steel was essential." End quote. For Mishima, the antidote to modernity was found in the classical spirit, and the spirit was best embodied through the art of bodybuilding. The discipline of sun and steel educated his body in the classical spirit. It restored to his body fue, and therefore cured his body of modernity. Nietzsche believed that the modern man would appear as a pale shade in comparison with the man of ancient Greece. But he held out hope that men could again reach such heights, and even surpass them. If we are to embark on this endeavor, if we are to turn the silence of death into the eloquence of life, if we are to transform shades back into demigods, we must begin with the body. <laughs>